uh, excuse me, American Council of Exercise Weight Management Specialist, Integrative Wellness Coach, and a Level 1 CrossFit Coach, and a Certified Personal Trainer through the American College of Sports Medicine. He operates Muscles and Veggies Fitness in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving you medical advice. Please consult with your doctor before discontinuing any medications or implementing any modalities that could uh, interfere with the medications or recommendations of your current physician. Now, said. Uh, what is wrong with the weight loss industry? And, and I'm just going to touch on this very briefly, but it's mostly just to give you an idea of what our problem is. We were just kind of talking before class about um, what the problem is in the U.S. population right now. So these are some older stats that I found. They're not the 2018 CDC stats currently. And just so you guys know, anything you see up here, you can um, go to my website and pull this same presentation up. And these blue clickable links that you're going to see throughout this presentation are uh, where I source my information from. So you guys have access to all everything that I sourced from this. You guys can read too. So uh, right now, two thirds of Americans are either overweight or obese. So we've got basically 60, 70 percent of the country um, is carrying extra weight. The weight loss industry that you guys see represented right here is a 66 billion dollar industry just from diet subs and diet programs. Um, a quarter of the population is either pre-diabetic or diabetic. That number is actually wrong. Uh, it's, it's actually a quarter is diabetic and then there's another quarter that's pre-diabetic. So it's, that's actually gotten a lot worse. And you guys that um, have ever seen my type 2 diabetes pro program, I have all the latest stats in that one. Um, over one third of the population has a BMI over 30. So that classifies you as uh, obese. It was a BMI over 30. All right, so um, the last stat here. So the, just the, the cost, we were kind of talking about this before class, is the, we subsidize $347 billion a year just for type 2 diabetes. Just for obesity related things, another $147 billion. So now you see why we have the highest healthcare cost uh, ever in the history of humanity right now. It costs $14,000 to subsidize a, a diabetics medications for the year, that's an average. We have 30 million diabetics in the country. Um, so now you, now you can easily see why healthcare costs, it's 500 for a married couple in a certain tax bracket per month to have health insurance. I mean, it's absolutely insane. So this last one, uh, there's 200,000 bariatric surgeries being done. Uh, actually, right down the street here, roller weight loss, but 200,000 bariatric surgeries being done per year at an average cost between 10,000 and 20,000 per surgery. Uh, so I lowballed this at 10,000 times that by 200,000 surgeries. We're, we are spending $2 billion a year on bariatric surgery. So uh, th that's coming straight out of the American public's pocket is that $2 billion, right? Okay, so that gives you just an idea of what's going on in the U.S. population and, and what we're seeing. So why are we seeing what we're seeing? Well, uh, number one thing that we've lost is local seasonality. So I want to take you back um, 50 years ago. We didn't have a convenience store, a gas station, a grocery store. Uh, we barely had refrigerators 50 years ago, right? So the ability to have food at our disposal is, is very, very uh, common now. We have food everywhere we go. We have food. I mean, we should not be tripping out about um, where we're going to get our next meal, right? Because it's everywhere. It's literally everywhere we go. So we've lost local seasonality. You know, 150 years ago, if you were sitting out here on this field, um, and let's say it's you know this time of year, tell me where you what you would eat. Tomatoes. Tomatoes, yeah, yeah. Green beans. Green beans. Cows. Cows. Squash. Squash. Bacon. Deer, pig. Uh, maybe some rabbit, some squirrel, whatever you could get your hands on, right? There's yeah. berries out there, there's blackberries, there's... Uh, so you guys, you guys can see, right? Now, think about January. Middle of January, what would you eat here, out, out here in this field? Salt. 
maybe some tubers you you kept buried maybe um, possibly some apples I don't know how that kind of works but um, yeah I mean that's kind of like the 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 main stuff you're gonna be eating is meat and nuts things that are shelf stable and meat's not even shelf stable but you get my idea we've lost local seasonality and uh, now I can walk right out here and eat as many pineapples as I want I can eat as many jars of honey as I want. Now, if you're out in the wild out here, how often did you come across a beehive to get honey? No. <laughs> Man, when you did, you were loving life, right? Um, so that's my point with local seasonality. That's, that's, part of the, that's part of the situation that we're in. We've lost how to grow in our own backyards, how to eat local. Number two, we eat more uh, processed carbohydrates and refined sugars than at any other point in human history. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. You guys know this, right? Crazy. Uh, all right, so we move less than any other time in human history. So uh, moving less, uh, the average person, the average hunter-gatherer or ancestor of ours, anything in the, and besides modern humans in the last 100, 120 years, uh, they walked upwards to 10 to 20 miles a day in, in normal activity. The average American right now, you can look this up, walks anywhere between two and 4,000 steps per day. That's a one to one and a half miles per day. So we, we're moving less than any other time in human history, okay? Um, now what we're gonna touch on tonight is uh, all right. I skipped one. We are we are exposed to more toxins than any other point in human history. So there's like 77,000 man-made toxins we're exposed to in household cleaners, uh, our artificial environments, uh, brake dust in the air, exhaust fumes. I mean, you can just go on and on and on. But we have to detox those things out of our system, right? Well, guess what organ is the the main organ of detox? What is it? Your liver. Your liver. So guess what the main organ that regulates our blood sugar and fat burning, what's that? The liver. The liver. So that's part of this problem. Okay, you can see how this ties together. Uh, the one we're gonna touch on tonight is we have more gut and hormone problems than any other time in human history. And I, last week I did a presentation, or not last week, two weeks ago I did a presentation on uh, sleep. So I'm gonna do that one again um, because that is the other side to this equation. I basically, whenever I deal with a client, I'm looking at three pillars outside of nutrition, outside of food, I'm looking at three things. How do you sleep? How stressed are you? How much toxins are you exposed to and are you detoxing like crazy? And then, oh yeah, I'm sorry, stress, sleep, and toxins. That's what I'm looking at outside of what you're eating. So, um, and people, let's face it, like no one's really talking about this, but this, we have to free up the systems of the body uh, that we can make fat metabolism really, really happen. All right, so, and then the last one is uh, we're on more medications than any other time in human history, and there's a laundry list of medications that will keep weight on us as the American public. Uh, so Hippocrates said this back a long time ago, all disease begins in the gut. Uh, very wise man. So this is some stats from Dr. Axe's website. Um, 70 million people are suffering from digestive diseases. This is like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and IBS and uh, celiac and you know all these different things. Uh, 60 percent, 60 to 80 percent of our immune system is located in the gut. Okay, if you guys have anybody in your life that's chronically sick all the time, always has head cold, sinus infections. Um, probably a really good chance they have some, some gut problems. Um, let's see. That's pretty much all I'm going to touch on there. Um, so what does the microbiome do? What is, what is the big deal with the gut? Why are people taking so much probiotics and talking about gut health, right? This is what, the, it, the, this is what orchestrates us taking in nutrients is our digestive system. I don't care how much organic food you're buying, how much good supplements you're buying, all you're making is expensive pee and poo if you have a screwed up gut. I am dead serious, like dead serious. You can spend, I don't care if you have a thousand dollar budget out here 
for food and probiotics and supplements, you're wasting your money if this system isn't working right. So um, we have to have, and this is kind of how this works. So when food comes in, the first thing that happens is our enzymatic process begins in the mouth. We salivate and that actually releases some enzymes that actually start to break down the food as it goes down into our stomach. The stomach primarily secretes from its lining, it secretes stomach acid or hydrochloric acid. That is the major antibacterial sanitizer of what's coming into your body. So this holds down pathogens and bad bacteria. It's so important that you have adequate stomach acid levels. Now, um, the next thing that happens is that acidity churns up this, uh, this food and turns it into what's called chyme or chyme, depending on how you pronounce it. And that acidity starts the process to open the pyloric sphincter to let the food go into the, the small intestine. Okay? Now the food's going into the small intestine and what happens is the small intestine signals the pancreas based on that acidity to release pancreatic enzyme. So now we have all the enzymes to digest the different uh, plants, meats, fats, carbs, all these different things, fiber. Uh, we have the right enzyme combination to, to break all that down and derive energy from it, right? If, this, if the chyme is not acidic enough, if your stomach acid is low, the pancreas doesn't get the signal. You never get pancreatic enzyme. So here's the, here's the downward spiral right here. It starts out, and we're going to talk about this tonight, is what produces low stomach acid. Low stomach acid leads to low enzymes. Low enzymes doesn't let your bile get secreted. That's the third thing that happens in digestion is our liver and our gallbladder stores bile. So bile is a detox. It really is. Our body takes toxins and makes this super uh, concentrated acidic su substance in the gallbladder and then releases that to emulsify fats. Well then when we, when we do that, right, what do we do? We excrete all that. So not only does it, it does two things. God was really smart when he did this. It does two things. It detoxif or I'm sorry, it emulsifies fats, but it's all the crud from our body that also emulsifies the fats, and then we get rid of all that. So if you have poor liver function or gallbladder function and poor bile production, you're not detoxing the crud out of your body and you're not emulsifying fats. So you can see how this is like, oh, it's orchestrated. That's why I use that word up there because it, it is. It's, it's this really complex design system that allows us to extract the most amount of nutrients out of our food so that we have everything we need. I was thinking about this the other day. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like our vehicle. You have to have the right amount of antifreeze. You have to have the right amount of oil. You have to have gasoline. You have to have, right? You have to have all these things to make that engine function right. If I run out of antifreeze, and I'm not getting that certain nutrient, right? Something is going to break down. It's the exact same thing with the body. If we're not, if we are not absorbing our nutrients from our food, we become vitamin deficient in an area, or we become, we don't have enough antioxidants or polyphenols or whatever it is, and then something breaks. That's, that is the process of how this works, right? So the other thing it does is it regulates our immune system. Um, so we have, Basically, the, the 90, 80, 90% 90 of our immune system resides in our gut. Uh, so the way that we fight off pathogens is also part of the bacteria that's, that's in our microbiome. Um, it provides us with certain vitamins and fatty acids. These bacteria are really cool, man. These bacteria actually, they eat food that we take in and they put out exhaust fumes. It's kind of like... Uh, it's kind of like a plant puts out carbon dioxide, right? It's the exact same thing. These, these uh, bacteria are eating certain things, mostly fiber, and then what, that's why they call it prebiotic fiber, and then they're putting off these exhaust fumes. Well, guess what these ex exhaust fumes are? Vitamin B6, vitamin B12, vitamin B5. All these vitamins that we use and need. So like, they really are a part of us, and based on how many and the right kinds of, are in our body, is how they produce the energy and vitamins and minerals that we need to go on. 
So it's, it's really cool how it all works and kind of as this cycle. So they produce these uh, short chain fatty acids that we use for fuel um, and along with a lot of other stuff too. So they also, uh, they make our neurotransmitters. So serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine are all made in the gut. So that means that you've got somebody who may be on SSRIs or antidepressants or something like that. Um, I can almost guarantee you they have digestion problems. They're not, di they either have low stomach acid, they don't have their enzyme production, they don't have their bile production. They're not making these, without these vitamins, and they're, they're not making the precursors to dopamine and serotonin. And without dopamine and serotonin, this person is blah, is blah. So in my practice, you don't know how many people I run into that like, they're like, oh, I'm on an SSRI, I deal with depression, I deal with panic attacks, I deal with anxiety. Man, we get them on a stomach acid, we get them on a, a digestive enzyme immediately, right out of the gate. And then the other thing you do is you, you go out here and you give them the precursors that make serotonin, like 5-HTP and tryptophan. These are amino acids. We absorb our amino acids, guess where? In the gut. So all these amino acids can't be absorbed without stomach acid. Stomach acid is what breaks down our protein. So if you ever have a meal where you eat something and within 15 minutes you're bloated, 20 minutes you're bloated, that is a clear cut sign that your body did not produce stomach acid in that instance. It could be from stress, it could be from a lot of things, uh, but if that protein, what happens is when it hits, it's not fermented by that, or I'm sorry, if it's not broken down by that stomach acid, that acidity, and it hits the bacteria, the bacteria start eating it, and that causes fermentation, that's what causes the gas. Like the bloating and gas immediately 15, 20 minutes after a meal. So you just ate an expensive cut of wild caught sockeye salmon, and guess who ate it? The bacteria did, not you. And that's not how we get amino acids. We get vitamins from them, but we don't get amino acids from them. So I'm sorry, I know I'm going off in the weeds here, but it's really important that we understand this is a complex process that I have to have stomach acid for protein. Now, I have to have these other things, the plant fiber, the plants, the tubers, you know, the carbs, the fats, I have, that, have to have that for energy. It's really simple. Protein is to literally rebuild our tissue and our body. And amino acids are what we need for all these other functions like neurotransmitters, um, you know, the laundry list of those things. Now, carbs and fats are literally for nothing else but energy. Uh, they do a little bit of vitamin, vitamin, minerals, antioxidants, polyphenols, the stuff that we absorb from them. But the main function of carbohydrates and fats are fuel. Fats are a long lasting fuel. They're like throwing logs on my fire, right? They're gonna burn a while. Carbohydrates are like the paper shavings I pull out of my shredder. They burn fast, really, really hot, but they don't stick around that long. Does that make sense? So that's how you can fuel, fuel. That's how you can view fuel when it comes to carbs and protein, or I'm sorry, carbs and fats. All right, so the other thing that it makes in the gut is thyroid hormone, number one. So if you, uh, you take somebody who's hypothyroid, um, almost always, 95% of the time, this person will have digestive problems. They will have low stomach acid, they will have digestive enzyme problems. Um, and, and guess why their, their hypothyroidism, it's a combination of things, but part of the, the equation has to deal with digestive problems. So we make um, we make uh, free T4 and free T3 and we make all that in the gut and we uptake it to use it for our thyroid production. The other thing that we make and regulate in the gut, and we're going to talk about this tonight, is, uh, is estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So all these hormones have to do with gut function. Our estrogen is mainly regulated by the gut. Um, and so let's back up a little bit. Conventional dairy, um, some of you guys have heard me talk about this before, but what makes, what makes a cow lactate 365 days a year? When it's not having a baby, what makes it lactate 365 days a year? What do they give it? Hormones. Hormones. Primarily estrogen. Do you know if you give me enough estrogen, I'll lactate? 
crazy, right? So that's what they give these cows is gigantic elevations of estrogen, right? So that estrogen is not natural. That sticks around in that cow. Plus you talk about uh, the, the milk that they're literally pulling out of the cow and not letting it, the udders do their job. Mm -hmm. But the, the point, my point is, is that conventional dairy is part of the reason why we're seeing estrogen dominance. The other side of the coin of why we're seeing so much estrogen dominance mm -hmm. and men yeah. developing gynecomastia, breasts and things like that is from our gut regulates estrogen in the body and it has the ability to shuttle estrogen out or keep circulating it if that system is broken and it's not working correctly. So this is a recipe to hold weight, mostly in our midsection, our thighs, and our hips. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the main part of the hormone stuff that we're gonna talk about tonight. The other thing the gut does is suppresses inflammation. So here's, you got this cycle of lots of sugary, refined, processed foods combined with a lot of stress. You've got all this inflammation going on. Now your gut health fails. It was, it's what suppresses inflammation. You've suddenly turned into a really, really inflamed individual and you're like, do I have rheumatoid arthritis? I'm like walking around with pain everywhere. Uh, sick all the time. You know, I'm swollen. I've got everything's, uh, my feet are swollen, my hands are swollen, everything's got fluid in it. I mean, that is inflammation. That is the, the definition of inflammation. Uh, this is from Dr. Jocker's uh, website. He's got a ton of really good information on the gut. That's like my source go-to of uh, information when it comes to the gut and then and things like that. So you can check that out. All right, so in my experience, this is the top reasons for fat loss plateaus. And, and you're gonna see here a cycle that's going on. Number one is, the number one thing is gut problems, okay? Um, I, I run frequently a test called the organic acid test. The organic acid test is a urinary test that uh, we excrete organic acids from our body. You can measure a lot of things from these organic acids. I can tell you what your levels of yeast are in your body. I can tell what levels of bacteria you have in your body, lactobacillus, bifidus bacteria, whether you're eating polyphenols or not. I can tell you how you're detoxing. I can tell you how, what your dopamine levels are, what your serotonin levels are, what your epinephrine and norepinephrine, your adrenaline is. Um, there, I can tell you every, almost every single vitamin B, vitamin C, glutathione, everything, whether you're vitamin deficient. I can see every one of your amino acids and see which amino acid you're not even registering on the board. So I'll get people and they'll say, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, uh, I can't lose weight no matter what I do. Uh, they have all these issues, right? And I'm like, all right, let's run an organic acid test. So we do it, it comes back. The first thing I look at is their amino acids and they're like, we have nine essential amino acids, right? They're essential to uh, make everything we need in the body. That's why they're called essential, because we don't create them, we have to get them externally. So the first thing I look at is those, and then you've got four out of nine that are 0.0. .0. Automatically, I know they're not absorbing their amino acids, because they're not even registering on the board. So you've got half of your amino acids not even, not even being digested in the gut. So the next thing that I look at is what do the bacteria and yeast look like? And you would be shocked at how much I run across people that are full of yeast and candida. You know what feeds uh, yeast? Sugar. sugar. So we've already talked about how the American public eats more sugar than any other time in human history. So it's not a shocker as we look at a gut panel that yeast is through the roof. Well, what happens when you have candida overgrowth? Um, your gut, your jungle of microbiome that has all these different species of bacteria is now taken over by yeast. It's completely invaded by yeast. This yeast is actually controlling your body. Um, it's controlling your cravings. This is why with candida you have crazy sugar cravings. Like you feel like you start eating sugar and you cannot stop. I mean like, um, man, I know I'm full. I know that I'm satisfied but I am still thinking about that chocolate bar in the fridge and I get up and I go over there and I take a square off and I eat it and I'm like satisfied for like a minute and then I'm back thinking, man, that chocolate bar is still in there. And you know how I know? Because I had candida when I tested for it. So I actually had to go through my own protocol 
to get yeast down in my body because it was even high in me. I've been eating the ketogenic diet for three years. Haven't you know? It's not like sugar is a regular part of my diet or anything like that. But my point is, is that this is so common, right? So the other thing that happens is uh, lactobacillus and bifidus bacteria are really, really important bacteria that regulate our, our fatty acid production. We don't have enough of these two species. Uh, you will not have a good fat burning metabolism. Uh, it's very, very vital to have these species. So uh, what knocks down these species? A yeast overgrowth. Uh, a, a Clostridium difficile overgrowth, which is another bad bacteria. They kill Lactobacillus and Bifidus. All right, so I'm not gonna like go crazy into the weeds on this, but um, it's really important that uh, that's the number one thing I see with weight loss stalls or weight loss plateaus, is a screwed up either yeast or bacteria compilation in the gut. The second thing is thyroid problems. So. Thyroid problems is really, really common because we talked about what happens when the thyroid, what, how do we uptake the thyroid? The gut, right? So the problem is though, is that um, doctors get you in and what do they test for? They test for TSH and they test for T4. They don't test you for T3 or reverse T3 and they don't test you for thyroid antibodies. So you need those five things when you get a thyroid test done. And then the other thing is, you don't know how many people that I get and they come to me and they're like, I'm on thyroid medication. I'm like, all right, we need to fix your digestion. <laughs> but yeah. like immediately, they, I say, what are you on? What thyroid med are you on? And gosh darn it, nine out of 10 of them are on Synthroid. Synthroid is T4 only. Bear with me for a second. T3 is the active thyroid hormone that we use in the body. T4 has to be converted to T3 for us to use it. Guess what converts T4 to T3? The gut does. Our gut has to convert T4 to T3. Synthroid is 100% T4. If you have a screwed up gut, you, will, you can take as much Synthroid as you want and you will not convert it to T3. This is why I see so many people over and over again that come in and they are on Synthroid and their hair is still falling out, they're cold, they've still put on weight, they can't lose it over and over and over again. And you get this person on a T3 supplement or on Armour or Nature Throid or... Uh, so if you get someone on Levothyroxine or Nature Throid, some kind of real T3 uh, prescription, then very quickly you see this person feel so much better. Um, so that's all we're going to touch on, on the thyroid problems. Uh, hormone problems. Now when you think about the gut and you think about hormone problems, we actually regulate our primary hormones in the gut. Uh, so for example, what we're gonna talk about is how the gut microbiome actually regulates estrogen dominance. So this was a study over here that I found uh, that actually proved that our gut microbiota has the uh, ability to influence many diseases that have to do with estrogen dominance. You'll see these over here, PCOS, endometriosis, prostate cancer, and candida overgrowth. Now, uh, this estrogen imbalance was tied back to the gut regulating the circulation of estrogen. So basically the long story short here is when our gut microbiome is screwed up, then what happens is we're not detoxing or passing uh, and getting rid of xenoestrogens and estradiol. And what they're ha what's happening is they're actually getting recirculated back into the body. So then we develop estrogen dominance and estrogen dominance leads to all these symptoms. If you're wondering if you have symptoms of estrogen dominance, uh, or I'm sorry, all these diseases, if you're wondering if you have symptoms of all this estrogen dominance, uh, this starts with bloating, uh, swelling and tenderness of the breast, especially around the menstrual cycle. Uh, if you notice that you get really sore, tender breasts, that could be an estrogen dominance thing. Uh, lumps in your breast or fibrous um, type clumps, things like that. Uh, decreased libido is a huge one. Uh, irregular menstrual periods. So if you notice like one month, you're 21 days, another month, you're 29 days, that's a really good indication of estrogen dominance. Uh, increased symptoms of PMS mood swings, headaches. Uh, so it basically really bad PMS and irregular periods is like a no brainer that you have 
uh, estrogen dominance going on in the body. And primarily in the gut, what affects this the most is candida overgrowth. So uh, that's why we want to make sure that we are not feeding yeast. And what feeds yeast? Um, sugar. Sugar feeds yeast. That's how we brew beer. That's how we um, do a lot of things when it comes to feeding kombucha and things like that. You feed it yeast with sugar. Okay. So um, this also can throw off a lot of things because candida causes massive cravings in the gut. I'm sorry, in the brain from the gut. So when you have uh, massive cravings, this ends up developing insulin resistance. When you get insulin resistance, then uh, suddenly you have high cortisol because your body is stressed out because insulin resistance, the insulin hormone is not working properly. So you're having blood sugar swings, highs and lows. This, and that leads us to number four, which is chronic stress. So chronic stress can actually have a massive implication on the gut. Um, we're going to look at specifically one area that really, really affects the gut, and that is intestinal permeability. So uh, if I back up here, intestinal permeability, this was a study that they actually did, and intestinal permeability is basically the gut lining uh, are these very, very tight junctions. And what they do is they allow broken down amino acids and broken down fatty acids and things like that to cross the intestinal barrier and enter into the bloodstream so we can use them for fuel and for recovery and things like that. Uh, so when you have intestinal permeability, the, the junctions in your gut are so wide or you have leaky gut that whole food particles are entering into the bloodstream and the body looks at that as a toxin. So immediately raises inflammation through the roof. This study right here that we're looking at, intestinal permeability every single time, the higher the intestinal permeability, the higher the depression. The higher the intestinal permeability, the higher the anxiety. The higher the intestinal permeability, the higher that person had cravings. So uh, you can really see how this really plays a toll when it comes to leaky gut. Now, how does stress play into that? Stress actually plays into that a lot of different ways. But first, let's touch on the bacteria and how the bacteria that's in our gut actually plays a role. So if you don't believe me that the brain uh, gets its neurotransmitters from the gut, here's a study off PubMed.com. And PubMed is a national scientific database for literature for uh, Crossover studies, double-blind, placebo, crossover. Uh, this is where all the big studies take place in the, in the scientific journals so that doctors and scientists can log in and view these. Now, it just so happens to be public information, so we can view it too. And if you notice here, lactobacillus is a species in the gut. It actually produces acetylcholine and GABA. Bifidobacteria, which is another species in the gut that's really important, produces GABA. And then SK, I'm not even going to pronounce that. This bacteria right here produces norepinephrine or adrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine. So that's a really important bacteria. And so is this. And so is this. Uh, Streptococcus and enterococcus produce serotonin. And uh, bacillus species produce norepinephrine and dopamine. Now, that's a big, long hodgepodge of words to basically say that our gut bacteria have a major role in producing our feel-good brain chemicals. All right, now going back to the stress problems when it comes to um, the leaky gut, when your body is stressed out, your cortisol is very high. And what ends up happening is uh, the body needs amino acids. And when your gut is screwed up already, when your bacterial balance is out of whack, you're not absorbing your amino acids correctly. So then you have to take from other amino acids that are already present in the body. And one of those is L-glycine. And L-glycine is what, and L-glutamine and L-glycine are what our gut lining are actually made out of. So uh, what ends up happening, the, the more stress you get, the more screwed up your gut bacteria gets, or maybe you have a yeast overgrowth, then 
uh, it takes L-glutamine and L-glycine from the gut lining and then you start having a thinner, um, you have a thinner intestinal barrier or leaky gut and that's how that develops. So chronic stress is a, is a major player in this. We all live in a modern society with tons of stress. So creating a stress routine can be really, really important. Getting tons of sunshine will up your serotonin levels. Tons of serotonin left over at the end of the day converts to melatonin. And then melatonin helps us recover and sleep better so we don't wake up that next day stressed out again, getting quality sleep. So my top five tips for improving gut health, it starts with the bugs that you feed. So nutrition first, find some version of a no wheat, no conventional dairy, no added sugar nutrition plan. I don't like the word diet, I like the word nutrition. So we're not gonna talk about diets because diets suck. But we wanna eat nutritiously and I'm not going to preach on here about what diet is the best or what mode of nutrition is the best. So all I want you to do is focus on eliminating wheat, eliminating conventional dairy. It's okay to have raw organic cheeses and raw organic uh, dairy products. Uh, the closer to the farm you can get it, the better. But absolutely a no sugar, no added sugar nutrition plan. Natural sugars occurring in honey and fruit and things like that, absolutely great. They come with polyphenols, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, all the good stuff that our body needs in the first place. Number two, eat probiotic rich foods. So I like to make my own coconut kefir and it's super easy. You get a can of coconut milk, full fat. You take the cream and the milk, throw it into a mason jar with some kefir grains. Every 24 hours, this will produce one cup of coconut kefir. Uh, it's amazing. Put it with blueberries and strawberries and raspberries. Oh, it's delightful. It's delightful. But tons of good bacteria in there. You can also do Greek yogurt, um, things like that. Also a whole milk kefir. Uh, make sure you get some sauerkraut in there. Sauerkraut's really easy to make at home. It just takes cabbage, water, and salt. It's literally that easy. It takes two weeks to ferment. Once it ferments with just the bacteria in the air, you've got awesome probiotic rich sauerkraut. Kimchi is another one. I really enjoy feta cheese on my salads along with pickles. Pickles is another fermented vegetable. So uh, entering in these sources on a daily basis will ensure that you have the right balances of lactobacillus, bifidus bacteria, that Escheria and Streptococcus and Enterococcus and all those bacteria that we just sh shown were really important. Uh, this will make sure that we have a good balance coming in through our diet. Find out, number three, find out if you have low stomach acid. If you have low stomach acid, uh, you really, really need to take action immediately. The stomach acid is primarily uh, what guards us against bacterial and pathogens entering in and taking over our gut and also making us sick as well. Stomach acid also breaks down our proteins and make sure that we can absorb those amino acids. I don't want to spend a bunch of money on wild caught sockeye salmon and not get to absorb the good stuff out of it. So find out if you have low stomach acid, Google search, uh, baking soda test, and also the Heidelberg test, things like that. You can ask your doctor about it. If you have a conventional doctor, good luck. Uh, number four, supplement with L-glutamine and collagen protein powder to rebuild the gut lining. This is really important uh, if, if you have leaky gut, and let's just say that most of America, 75% does. So if you, if it, it can't hurt to supplement with this either way. So about 3,000 milligrams or three grams of L-glutamine a day, along with about 10 to 30 grams of collagen protein powder a day as well. Uh, bone broth also works really good for this, uh, so you don't have to buy collagen protein. Um, Yes, so make sure you're attacking that to always heal the gut lining. Now, the, the fifth one goes along with that leaky gut. It also goes along with the uh, gut bacteria in a couple different ways. Number five, avoid antibiotics like the plague. Um, so antibiotics have saved millions of lives. They are an awesome resource, but we have severely 
over abused them and handed them out too regularly. I heard a stat the other day that said that uh, we prescribe 80 billion tons of antibiotics a year. 80 billion tons of antibiotics a year are given around the world. I don't think that's just in the country. I think that's around the world. Um, avoid non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, naproxen, things like that. Uh, avoid these things. Make sure here's why. Because uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen are like throwing hand grenades into your gut. They blow holes into your gut and cause leaky gut uh, or for intestinal permeability. So avoid those like the plague. I know so many people who take these on a daily basis. Break that habit if this is you. Uh, and then of course, like I said before, chronic stress will, will give you leaky gut. It will really make your life miserable. Chronic stress will also change your gut bacteria. So it's vitally important that you create a stress routine, uh, get off your computer, your phone, or your TV, or your tablet, or whatever, an hour or two before bed, read a book, go for a walk, stretch, uh, maybe some foam rolling. Things like that go a long, long way. Maybe it's art, maybe it's creativity, music, whatever that is for you, take advantage so that you can not only reduce your stress and, and burn more fat and have more energy and live a better life, but also to improve your gut health as well and make sure that you're getting into that parasympathetic state where we really rest and digest. And that's so important that when we eat, we slow down, we chew our food very thoroughly, uh, we, we start the digestion process in our mouth, and then we rest and digest and really provide a good environment uh, to break down that food and, and assimilate all the good stuff out of it. And this is the exact reason why uh, when we were kids, they told us not to swim right after we ate because we want the blood to go to our intestines and our digestive system to do its work. If we're moving and grooving and back into a stressful environment, uh, that blood is going other places and not going to the, the systems it needs to to digest our food. So that's my top five tips for improving the gut health. Work with a health coach or a functional medicine doctor that knows the gut well. Um, that's a very good tip if you know you have some severe digestion issues and you know you're screwed up, find a health coach or a functional medicine doctor that knows this stuff, um, preferably someone who knows the organic acid test. And uh, I just can't speak enough about how good this test has been in my practice. So that leads us into muscles and veggies. Uh, eat real food, build real muscle, live real awesome. So you can get help with nutrition, fat loss, uh, building muscle, digestion, sleep, stress, mobility, all in one place. Uh, call me for a free consultation. This is Zach with MusclesAndVeggies.com. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope you learned something out of it. Uh, sorry the video cut off halfway through, so I had to do this uh, from home for the rest of it. But it's probably better that way. You didn't have to listen to me ramble like an idiot in front of an audience. Um, so <laughs> thank you for watching and thank you for listening and stay tuned for more. Like this video and subscribe to the channel if you learned something or share it with someone who may be struggling with gut problems or digestion issues. Uh, let's get this message out to people and get people feeling better and living uh, more with more vitality and more energy. So thanks for watching.